The early Slavs were a diverse group of tribal societies who lived during the Migration Period and Early Middle Ages approximately the 5th to the 10th centuries in Eastern Europe and established the foundations for the Slavic nations through the Slavic states of the High Middle Ages. The first written use of the name, Slavs, dates to the 6th century, when the Slavic tribes inhabited a large portion of Central and Eastern Europe. By that century, native Iranian ethnic groups the Scythians, Sarmatians, and Alans had been absorbed by the region's Slavic population. Over the next two centuries, the Slavs expanded southwest toward the Balkans and the Alps and northeast towards the Volga River. It's still a matter of controversy where the original habitat of the Slavs was, but scholars believe it was somewhere in Eastern Europe. In the past not much attention was paid to the origin of the Slavic people. Beginning in the 9th century, the Slavs gradually converted to Christianity both Byzantine Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. By the 12th century, they were the core population of a number of medieval Christian states, East Slavs in the Kievan Rus, South Slavs in the Bulgarian Empire, the Kingdom of Croatia, Benete of Bosnia and the Grand Principality of Serbia, and West Slavs in the Great Moravia, the Kingdom of Poland, Duchy of Bohemia and Principality of Nitra. Origins Main articles, Vistula Veneti, Spori, Antis, Sklaveni, and Wens Ancient Roman and Greek historical sources refer to the early Slavic peoples as Veneti in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD, and later in the 5th and 6th centuries as Sporoi, Antis and Sklaveni. The 6th century Byzantine historian of Gothic extraction Jordanes, wrote in his 551 AD work Getica. Although they derive from one nation, now they are known under three names, the Veneti, Antis and Sklaveni. Ab unisterp exorti, tria nomina editirund, id est Veneti, Antis, Sklaveni, in reference to the Slavs. Later, during the early Middle Ages starting in the 8th century, early Slavs living on the borders of the Carolingian Empire were referred to as Wends. Early Slavic archaeological findings are most often associated with the Przeworsk and Zerubintsi cultures, with evidence ranging from hill forts, ceramic pots, weapons, jewelry and abodes. However, in many areas archaeologists face difficulties in distinguishing Slavic and non-Slavic findings, as the early Slavic culture over the subsequent centuries was heavily influenced by the Sarmatian culture from the east, and by the various Germanic cultures in the west. <laughs> Homeland The Proto-Slavic homeland is the area of Slavic settlement in Central and Eastern Europe during the first millennium AD, with its precise location debated by archaeologists, ethnographers and historians. Theories attempting to place Slavic origin in the Near East have been discarded. None of the proposed homelands reaches the Volga River in the east, over the Dinaric Alps in the southwest or the Balkan Mountains in the south, or past Bohemia in the west. Frederick Cortland has suggested that the number of candidates for Slavic homeland may rise from a tendency among historians to date, proto languages farther back in time than is warranted by the linguistic evidence. Although all spoken languages change gradually over time, in the absence of written records that change can be identified by historians only after a population has expanded and separated long enough to develop daughter languages. The existence of an original home is sometimes rejected as arbitrary, because the earliest origin sources always speak of origins and beginnings in a manner which presupposes earlier origins and beginnings. According to historical records, the Slavic homeland would have been somewhere in Central Europe, possibly along the southern shore of the Baltic Sea. The prague penkova kolochin complex of cultures during the 6th and 7th centuries AD is generally accepted to reflect the expansion of Slavic speakers at the time. Core candidates are cultures within the territories of modern Belarus, Poland, and Ukraine. According to Polish historian Gerard Labuda, the ethnogenesis of Slavic people is the Trusiniak culture from about 1700 to 1200 BC. The Milograd culture hypothesis posits that the pre-Proto-Slavs or Balto-Slavs originated in the 7th century BC 1st century AD culture of northern Ukraine and southern Belarus. According to the Chernols culture theory, the pre-Proto-Slavs originated in the 1025-700 BC culture of northern Ukraine and the 3rd century BC-1st century AD Zerubintsi culture. 
According to the Lusatian culture hypothesis, they were present in northeastern Central Europe in the 1300–500 BC culture and the 2nd century BC 4th century AD Przeworsk culture. The Danube Basin hypothesis, postulated by Oleg Trubachev and supported by Florin Kurta and Nestor's Chronicle, theorizes that the Slavs originated in Central and Southeastern Europe. The latest attempt of locating the place of Slavic origin using genetics, after studying paternal lineages of all existing modern Slavic populations, placed the earliest known homeland of Slavs within the area of the Middle Dnieper Basin in nowadays Ukraine. Linguistics Proto-Slavic began to evolve from Proto-Indo-European, the reconstructed language from which a number of languages spoken in Eurasia originated. Slavic languages share a number of features with Baltic languages including the use of genitive case for the objects of negative sentences, Proto-Indo-European K and other labialized velars, which may indicate a common Proto-Balto-Slavic phase in the development of the two of the Indo-European linguistic branches. Frederick Cortland places the territory of this common language near the Indo-European homeland. The Indo-Europeans who remained after the migrations became speakers of Balto-Slavic. However, geographical contiguity, parallel development and interaction may explain the existence of these language group characteristics. Proto-Slavic developed into a separate language during the first half of the 2nd millennium BC. The Proto-Slavic vocabulary, inherited by its daughter languages, described its speakers' physical and social environment, feelings and needs. Proto-Slavic had words for family connections, including Svekri, husband's mother, and Z, Li, sister-in-law. Inherited common Slavic vocabulary lacks detailed terminology for physical surface features peculiar to mountains or the steppe, the sea, coastal features, littoral flora or fauna, or saltwater fish. Proto Slavic hydronyms have been preserved between the source of the Vistula and the middle basin of the Dnieper. Its northern regions adjoin territory where river names of Baltic origin Dagava, Neman and others abound. On the south and east, it borders the area of Iranian river names including the Dniester, the Dnieper and the Don. A connection between Proto-Slavic and Iranian languages is also demonstrated by the earliest layer of loanwords in the former, the Proto-Slavic words for God asterisk bog, demon asterisk div, house asterisk hata, axe asterisk topper, and dog asterisk sobaka are of Scythian origin. The Iranian dialects of the Scythians and Sarmatians influenced Slavic vocabulary during the millennium-long contact between them and early Proto-Slavic. A longer, more intensive connection between Proto-Slavic and the Germanic languages can be assumed from the number of Germanic loanwords, such as asterisk duma, thought, asterisk kapiti, to buy, asterisk m, sword, asterisk selm, helmet, and asterisk x, lm, hill. The common Slavic words for beach, larch and yew were also borrowed from Germanic, which led Polish botanist Józef Rostofinski to place the Slavic homeland in the Pripet marshes where the plants were missing. Germanic languages were a mediator between common Slavic and other languages. The Proto-Slavic word for emperor, asterisk Caesar, was transmitted from Latin through a Germanic idiom, and the common Slavic word for church, asterisk CR, Kentucky, came from Greek. Common Slavic dialects before the 4th century AD cannot be detected. All daughter languages emerged from later variants. Tonal word stress a 9th century change is present in all Slavic languages, and Proto-Slavic reflects the language probably spoken at the end of the first millennium. Historiography Jordanes, Procopius and other late Roman authors provide the probable earliest references to southern Slavs in the second half of the 6th century. Jordanes completed his Gothic history an abridgment of Cassiodorus' longer work in Constantinople in 550 or 551. He also used additional sources, books, maps or oral tradition. Jordanes wrote that Venethi, Sclavines and Antes were ethnonyms referring to the same group. His claim was accepted more than a millennium later by Warzeniak Sarawiki, Pavel Josef Safarik and other historians, who searched the Slavic Urheimat in the lands where the Venethi a people named in Germania lived during the last decades of the 1st century AD. 
Pliny the Elder wrote that the territory extending from the Vistula to Aeningia probably Feningia, or Finland, was inhabited by the Sarmati, Wends, Suri and Hiri. Procopius completed his three works on Emperor Justinian I's reign buildings, history of the wars, and secret history during the 550s. Each book contains detailed information on raids by Sclavines and Antis on the Eastern Roman Empire, and the history of the wars has a comprehensive description of their beliefs, customs, and dwellings. Although not an eyewitness, Procopius had contacts among the Sclavine mercenaries fighting on the Roman side in Italy. Agreeing with Jordanes's report, Procopius wrote that the Sclavines and Antis spoke the same languages but traced their common origin not to the Venethi but to a people he called Sporoi. Sporoi. Seeds. In Greek, compare. Spores. Is equivalent to the Latin semnons and Germani. Germs. Or. Seedlings. German linguist Jacob Grimm believed that Subi meant Slav. Jordanes and Procopius called the Subi Suavi. The end of the Bavarian geographer's list of Slavic tribes contains a note. Suevi are not born, they are sown. Seminati. The language spoken by Tacitus's Suevi is unknown. In his description of the emigration c. 512 of the Heruli to Scandinavia, Procopius places the Slavs in Central Europe. A similar description of the Sclavines and Antis is found in the Strategicon of Maurice, a military handbook written between 592 and 602 and attributed to the Byzantine Emperor. Its author, an experienced officer, participated in the Eastern Roman campaigns against the Sclavines on the Lower Danube at the end of the century. A military staff member was also the source of Theophylact Simicata's narrative of the same campaigns, although Martin of Braga was the first Western author to refer to a people known as Sclavis. Before 580, Jonas of Bobbio included the earliest lengthy record of the nearby Slavs in his Life of St. Columbanus written between 639 and 643. Jonas referred to the Slavs as Veneti, noting that they were also known as Sclavi. Western authors, including Fredegar and Boniface, preserved the term Venethi. The Franks in the life of Saint Martinus, the chronicle of Fredegar and Gregory of Tours, Lombards Paul the Deacon and Anglo-Saxons referred to Slavs in the Elbsal region and Pomerania as Wenden or Winden. See Wends. The Franks and Bavarians of Styria and Carinthia called their Slavic neighbors Windish. The unknown author of the Chronicle of Fredegar used the word Venedi and variants to refer to a group of Slavs who were subjugated by the Avars. In the Chronicle, Venedi formed a state which emerged from a revolt led by the Frankish merchant Samo against the Avars around 623. A change in terminology, the appearance of Slavic tribal names instead of the collective Sklavines and Antis. Occurred at the end of the century, the first tribal names were recorded in the second book of the Miracles of St. Demetrius, around 690. According to Florin Kurta, the change indicates pre-existing differences among Slavic groups, although Sklavine may have originally been the ethnonym of a particular ethnic group, it became a purely Byzantine construct, an umbrella term for various groups living north of the Danube frontier, which were neither Antis, nor Huns or Avars. The unknown, Bavarian geographer, listed Slavic tribes in the Frankish Empire around 840, and a detailed description of 10th century tribes in the Balkan Peninsula was compiled under the auspices of Emperor Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus in Constantinople around 950. Archaeology In the archaeological literature, attempts have been made to assign an early Slavic character to several cultures in a number of time periods and regions. The Prague Korchak cultural horizon encompasses postulated early Slavic cultures from the Elbe to the Dniester, in contrast with the Dniester to Dnieper Penkovka culture. Prague culture refers to Western Slavic material grouped around Bohemia, Moravia and Western Slovakia, distinct from the Mogila southern Poland and Korczyk central Ukraine and southern Belarus groups further east. The Prague and Mogila groups are seen as the archaeological reflection of 6th century Western Slavs. The 2nd to 5th century Cherniakov culture encompassed modern Ukraine, Moldova and Wallachia. Cherniakov finds include polished black pottery vessels, fine metal ornaments and iron tools. Soviet scholars, such as Boris Rybakov, saw it as the archaeological reflection of the Proto-Slavs. 
The Cherniakov zone is now seen as representing the cultural interaction of several peoples, one of which was rooted in Scytho Sarmatian traditions, modified by Germanic elements introduced by the Goths. The semi subterranean dwelling with a corner hearth later became typical of early Slavic sites, with Volodymyr Baron calling it a Slavic ethnic badge. In the Carpathian foothills of Podolia, at the northwestern fringes of the Cherniakov zone, the Slavs gradually became a culturally unified people. The multi ethnic environment of the Cherniakov zone presented a need for self identification in order to manifest their differentiation from other groups. The Przeworsk culture, northwest of the Cherniakov zone, extended from the Dniester to the Tissa Valley and north to the Vistula and Oder. It was an amalgam of local cultures, most with roots in earlier traditions modified by influences from the Celtic Latine culture, Germanic Jasterf culture beyond the Oder and the Belgrave culture of the Polish plain. The Venethi may have played a part, other groups included the Vandals, Burgundians and Sarmatians. East of the Przeworsk zone was the Zerubinitz culture, sometimes considered part of the Przeworsk complex. Early Slavic hydronyms are found in the area occupied by the Zerubinitz culture, and Irena Rusinova proposed that the most prototypical examples of prog-type pottery later originated there. The Zerubinitz culture is identified as proto-Slavic or an ethnically mixed community which became Slavicized, with increasing age, the confidence with which archaeological connections can be made to known historic groups lessens. The Chernols culture has been seen as a stage in the evolution of the Slavs, and Maria Gimbutas identified it as the Proto-Slavic homeland. According to many pre-historians, ethnic labels are inappropriate for European Iron Age peoples. The globular amphora culture stretched from the Middle Dnieper to the Elbe during the late 4th and early 3rd millennia BC. It has been suggested as the locus of a Germano-Balto-Slavic continuum the Germanic substrate hypothesis, but the identification of its bearers as Indo-Europeans is uncertain. The area of this culture contains a number of tumuli, typical of Indo-Europeans. The 8th to 3rd century BC Chernels culture, sometimes associated with Herodotus, Scythian farmers, is sometimes portrayed as either a state in the development of the Slavic languages or at least some form of late Indo-European ancestral to the evolution of the Slavic stock." The Milograd culture 700 BC to 100 AD, centered roughly in present-day Belarus and north of the Chernols culture, has also been proposed as ancestral for the Slavs or the Balts. The ethnic composition of the Przeworsk culture, 2nd century BC 4th century AD, associated with the Lugi of central and southern Poland, northern Slovakia and Ukraine, including the Zerubintsi culture, 2nd century BC 2nd century AD and connected with the Bastarnai tribe and the Oksiwi culture are other candidates. Southern Ukraine is known to have been inhabited by Scythian and Sarmatian tribes before the Goths. Early Slavic stone stelae found in the Middle Dniester region are markedly different from the Scythian and Sarmatian stelae of the Crimea. The wheelbark culture displaced the Eastern Oksiwi culture during the 1st century AD. Although the 2nd to 5th century Cherniakov culture triggered the decline of the late Sarmatian culture from the 2nd to 4th centuries, the western part of the Przeworsk culture remained intact until the 4th century and the Kiev culture flourished from the 2nd to the 5th centuries. The latter is recognized as the predecessor of the 6th and 7th century Prague Korchik and Penkovo cultures, the first archaeological cultures identified as Slavic. Although Proto Slavic probably reached its final stage in the Kiev area, there is disagreement in the scientific community about the Kiev culture's predecessors. Some scholars trace it from the Ruthenian Milograd culture, others from the Ukrainian Chernols and Zerubintsi cultures, and still others from the Polish Przeworsk culture. Ethnogenesis The Slavic population of Eastern Europe expanded during the 6th century, bringing their customs and language. Although there is no consensus about their homeland, scholars generally look north of the Carpathians. Russian archaeologist Valentin Sadov, using the Herderian concept of nationhood, proposed that the Venethi were the proto-Slavic bearers of the Przeworsk culture. Their expansion began during the 2nd century AD, and they occupied a large area of Eastern Europe between the Vistula and the Middle Dnieper. The Venethi slowly expanded south and east by the 4th century, assimilating the neighboring Zerubinek culture which Sadov considered partly Baltic and continuing southeast to become part of the Cherniakov culture. 
The Andes separated themselves from the Venethi by 300 followed by the Sklaveni by 500 in the areas of the Penkovka and Prague Korchik cultures, respectively. During the 7th century BC, the Chernols culture was loosely governed by the Scythians via trade. There was limited interaction between the Slavs, who were tribute paying Scythian plowmen, and the nomads. Their homeland in the forest steppe enabled them to preserve their language, except for phonetic and some lexical constituents and their patrilineal, agricultural customs. After a millennium, when the Hunnic Empire collapsed, an Eastern Slavic culture re-emerged and spread rapidly in South and Central Eastern Europe. According to Maria Gimbutas, "...neither Bulgars nor Avars colonized the Balkan Peninsula, after storming Thrace, Illyria and Greece they went back to their territory north of the Danube." It was the Slavs who did the colonizing. Entire families or even whole tribes infiltrated lands. As an agricultural people, they constantly sought an outlet for the population surplus. Suppressed for over a millennium by foreign rule of Scythians, Sarmatians and Goths, they had been restricted to a small territory, now the barriers were down and they poured out. In addition to their growth, the depopulation of Eastern Europe due, in part, to Germanic migration and the lack of imperial defences encouraged Slavic expansion. With processual archaeology during the 1960s, scholars began to believe that, there was no need to explain culture change exclusively in terms of migration and population replacement. According to historical linguist Johanna Nichols, Ethnic spreads can involve either the spread of a language to speakers of other languages or the spread of a population. Massive population spread or demographic replacement has probably been a rarity in human history. Here is no reason to assume that the Slavic expansion was a primarily demographic event. Some migration took place, but the parsimonious assumption is the Slavic expansion was primarily a linguistic spread. Colin Renfrew proposed elite dominance and system collapse theories to explain language replacement. Dolokhanov suggested that their experience with nomads enabled the Slavs' political and military experience, becoming a dominant force and establishing a new socio political network in the entire area of Central and Southeastern Europe. According to Paul Barford, the Spartan and egalitarian Slavic culture clearly had something attractive for great numbers of the populations living over considerable areas of Central Europe," resulting in their assimilation. The analysis of Slav material culture especially South Slavs and results of anthropological investigations, as well as the loan words in philological studies, clearly demonstrate the contribution of the previous populations of these territories in the makeup of some of the Slav populations. Byzantine chroniclers noted that Roman prisoners captured by the Sclavines could soon become free members of Slavic society if they wished. Horace Lunt attributed Slavic spread to the "...success and mobility of the Slavic special border guards of the Avar Khanate." Military elites, who used it as a lingua franca in the Avar Khanate. According to Lunt, only as a lingua franca could Slavic supplant other languages and dialects whilst remaining relatively uniform. Although it explains the formation of regional Slavic groups in the Balkans, Eastern Alps and the Morava Danube Basin, Lunt's theory does not account for Slavic spread to the Baltic region and the territory of the Eastern Slavs areas with no historical links to the Avar Khanate. A concept related to elite dominance is system collapse, where a power vacuum created by the fall of the Hun and Roman empires allows a minority group to impose their customs and language. Paul Barford suggested that Slavic groups might have existed in a wide area of Central Eastern Europe in the Cherniakov and Zerubintsi Przeworsk cultural zones before the documented Slavic migrations from the 6th to the 9th centuries. Serving as auxiliaries in the Sarmatian, Goth and Hun armies, small numbers of Slavic speakers might have reached the Balkans before the 6th century. These scattered groups were centers for the creation of a Slavic cultural identity under favorable conditions, assimilating or conveying their culture and language. A similar idea has been proposed by Florin Kurta. Seeing no clear evidence for a migration from Polesia or elsewhere north, Kurta suggests that southeastern Europe saw the development of a broad area of common economic and cultural traditions. 
Whether living within the same region or widely scattered, adherence to this style helped to integrate isolated individuals within a group whose social boundaries crisscrossed those of local communities. During the early 600s, however, at the time of the general collapse of the Byzantine administration in the Balkans, access to and manipulation of such Slavic artifacts may have been strategies for creating a new sense of identity for local elites. Kurta suggests that the chief impetus for this identity originated in the Danubian frontier. Scholars acknowledge that an attempt to define a localized Slavic homeland may be simplistic. Although Proto-Slavic may have developed in a localized area, Slavic ethnogenesis occurred in a large area, from the Oder in the west to the Dnieper in the east and south to the Danube. It was a complex process, fueled by changes in the Barbaricum and the Roman Empire. Despite cultural uniformity, Slavic development seems to have been less politically consolidated than that of the Germanic peoples. According to Patrick Geary, Slavic expansion was a decentralized but forceful process which assimilated a large population with small groups of soldier farmers who had common traditions and language. Without kings or large scale chieftains to bribe or defeat, the Byzantine Empire had little hope of either destroying them or co opting them into the imperial system. Walter Pohl agrees, Avars and Bulgars conformed to the rules of the game established by the Romans. They built up a concentration of military power that was paid, in the last resort, from Roman tax revenues. Therefore they paradoxically depended on the functioning of the Byzantine state. The Slavs managed to keep up their agriculture, and a rather efficient kind of agriculture, by the standards of the time, even in times when they took their part in plundering Roman provinces. The booty they won apparently did not at least initially, create a new military class with the greed for more and a contempt for peasants' work, as it did with the Germans. Thus the Slavic model proved an attractive alternative, which proved practically indestructible. Slav traditions, language, and culture shaped, or at least influenced, innumerable local and regional communities, a surprising similarity that developed without any central institution to promote it. These regional ethnogenesis inspired by Slavic tradition incorporated considerable remnants of Roman or Germanic population ready enough to give up ethnic identities that had lost their cohesion. Topic appearance Barford cited Procopius as writing that the Slavs are tall and especially strong, their skin is not very white, and their hair is neither blonde nor black, but all have reddish auburn hair. They are neither dishonorable nor spiteful, but simple in their ways, like the Huns avars. Some of them do not have either a tunic or cloak, but only wear a kind of breeches pulled up to the groin. Modern Slavic people are among the least red-haired in Europe with a usual frequency of less than a percent. Today the modern Slavic people come from a wide variety of genetic backgrounds. The frequency of the haplogroup R1A which is a DNA, is a human Y chromosome lineage and ranges accordingly, 63.39% by the Sorbs, 56.4% in Poland, 54% in Ukraine, 47% in Russia, 39% in Belarus, 15.2% in Republic of Macedonia, 14.7% in Bulgaria and 12.1% in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Anthropological investigation of prehistoric Slavic sites appears to support views, suggesting that the early Slavs were dolicocephalic and fair-haired. However, biological anthropology especially the cranial index has been devalued. According to Luigi Luca Cavalli Sforza, anthropological observations are as likely to reflect socio-economic, nutritional or environmental factors as genetic differences. Topic society Early Slavic society was a typical, decentralized tribal society of Iron Age Europe, organized into local chiefdoms. A slow consolidation occurred between the 7th and 9th centuries. During this period, the previously uniform Slavic cultural area evolved into discrete zones. Slavic groups were influenced by neighboring cultures like Byzantium, the Khazars, the Vikings, and the Carolingians, influencing their neighbors in return. Differences in status gradually developed in the chiefdoms, leading to the development of centralized socio political organizations. The first centralized organizations may have been temporary pan tribal warrior associations. The greatest evidence for this is in the Danubian area, where barbarian groups organized around military chiefs to raid Byzantine territory and defend themselves against the Pannonian Avars. Social stratification gradually developed in the form of fortified, hereditary chiefdoms, first seen in the West Slavs areas. The chief was supported by a retinue of warriors who owed their position to him. 
As chiefdoms became powerful and expanded, centers of subsidiary power ruled by lesser chiefs were created, the line between powerful chiefdoms and centralized medieval states is blurred. By the mid-9th century, the Slavic elite was sophisticated. They wore luxurious clothing, rode horses, hunted with falcons and traveled with retinues of soldiers. Topic. Settlements Early Slavic settlements were no larger than 0.5 to 2 hectares 1.2 to 4.9 acres. Settlements were often temporary, perhaps reflecting their itinerant form of agriculture, and were often along rivers. They were characterized by sunken buildings, known as Grubenhauser in German or Paluzemlienki in Russian. Built over a rectangular pit, they varied from 4 to 20 square meters 43 to 215 square feet in area and could accommodate a typical nuclear family. Each house had a stone or clay oven in a corner a defining feature of Eastern European dwellings, and a settlement had a population of 50 to 70. Settlements had a central, open area, where communal activities and ceremonies were conducted, and were divided into production and settlement zones. Strongholds appeared during the 9th century, especially the Western Slavic territories, and were often found in the center of a group of settlements. The South Slavs did not form enclosed strongholds, they lived in open, rural settlements adopted from the social models of the indigenous populations they encountered. Topic. Tribal and territorial organization There is no indication of Slavic chiefs in any of the Slavic raids before AD 560, until pseudo Caesarius writings, who mentioned their chiefs, but described the Slavs as leaving by their own law and without the rule of anyone. The Sklaveni and the Antis were reported to have lived under a democracy for a long time. The 6th century Procopius, who was in contact with Slavic mercenaries, reported. For these nations, the Sklaveni and the Antis, are not governed by one man, but from ancient times have lived in democracy, and consequently everything which involves their welfare, whether for good or for ill, is referred to the people." The 6th century Strategicon of Maurice is considered an eyewitness of the Slavs. He recommended the Roman generals to use any possible means to prevent the Sklaveni from uniting, under one ruler, and added, the Sklaveni and Antis were both independent, absolutely refused to be enslaved or governed, least of all in their own land. Settlements were not uniformly distributed, they are found in clusters, separated by areas of lower settlement density. The clusters resulted from the expansion of single settlements, and these settlement cells were linked by familial or clan relationships. Settlement cells were the basis of the simplest form of territorial organization, known as a zupa in South Slavic and opol in Polish. According to the primary chronicle, the men of the Polony lived each with his own clan in his own place. Several zupas, encompassing individual clan territories, formed the known tribes. The complex processes initiated by the Slav expansion and subsequent demographic and ethnic consolidation culminated in the formation of tribal groups, which later coalesced to create state which form the framework of the ethnic makeup of modern Eastern Europe. The root of many tribal names denotes the territory which they inhabited, such as the Milcheni, who lived in areas with Mel, Lois, Moravians along the Morava, Diocletians near the former Roman city of Dokli, and Severiani northerners. Other names have more general meanings, such as the Polanes Pola, field, and Drevlians Drevo, tree. Others appear to have a non-Slavic root, such as the Antis, Serbs and Croats. Some geographically distant tribes appear to share names. The Dregoviti appear north of the Pripyat River and in the Vardar Valley, the Croats in Galicia and northern Dalmatia and the Obodrites near Lübeck and their further south in Pannonia. The root Slav was retained in the modern names of the Slovenes, Slovaks, Slavonians. There is little evidence of migratory links between tribes sharing the same name. The common names may reflect names given the tribes by historians or a common tongue as a distinction between Slavs Slovo, word, letter, and others. Nemci mutes, is a Slavic name for Germans. The first historical Slavic state was founded by Samo in the first half of the 7th century, a short-lived tribal union that included parts of Central Europe. By the 9th century, the states of Obotrites, Great Moravia, Carantania, Pannonia, Croatia, Serbia had emerged. Bulgaria, a non-Slavic creation, became Slavicized by the 10th century. 
Topic: <laughs> Marriage. Capturing wives and exogamy was a tradition among the tribes and continued up to the early medieval era. Although, on some occasions in Bohemia and the Ukraine men did not chose the spouse but women. For fornication the sentence among pagan Slavs was described as capital punishment by travelers, Ibn Fadlan, men and women go to the river and bathe together naked, but they do not fornicate and if anyone would be guilty of it, no matter who is he and she, he and she would be pinked by pole axe, then they hang out each part both of them on a tree, Gardizi, if someone makes fornication, he or she would be killed, without accepting any apologies. Warfare Early barbarian warrior bands, typically numbering 200 or less, were intended for fast penetration into enemy territory and an equally quick withdrawal. In Wars 7.14, 25, Procopius wrote that the Slavs, "...fight on foot, advancing on the enemy, in their hands they carry small shields and spears, but they never wear body armor." According to the Strategicon, the Slavs favored ambush and guerrilla tactics and often attacked their enemy's flank. They are armed with short spears, each man carries two, one of them with a large shield." Sources also mention the use of cavalry. Theophylact Simicata wrote that the Slavs, "...dismounted from their horses in order to cool themselves," during a raid, and Procopius wrote that Slav and Hun horsemen were Byzantine mercenaries. In their dealings with Sarmatians and Huns the Slavs may have become skilled horsemen, explaining their expansion. According to the Strategicon 11.4, I-45, the Slavs were a hospitable people who did not keep prisoners indefinitely, but lay down a certain period after which they can decide for themselves if they want to return to their former homelands after paying a ransom, or to stay amongst the Slavs as free men and friends. <laughs> Religion Little is known about Slavic religion before the Christianization of Kievan Rus. After Christianization, Slavic authorities destroyed many records of the old religion. Some evidence remains in apocryphal and devotional texts, the etymology of Slavic religious terms, and the primary chronicle. Early Slavic religion was relatively uniform, animistic, anthropomorphic, and inspired by nature. The Slavs developed cults around natural objects, such as springs, trees or stones, out of respect for the spirit or demon within. Slavic pre-Christian religion was originally polytheistic, with no organized pantheon. Although the earliest Slavs seemed to have a weak concept of God, the concept evolved into a form of monotheism where a supreme God ruled in heaven over the others. There is no evidence of a belief in fate or predestination. Pre-Christian Slavic spirits and demons could be entities in their own right or spirits of the dead, associated with home or nature. Forest spirits, entities in their own right, were venerated as the counterparts of home spirits, usually related to ancestors. Demons and spirits were good or evil, suggesting that the Slavs had a dualistic cosmology, and were revered with sacrifices and gifts. Slavic pre-Christianity was syncretistic, combined and shared with other religions, including Germanic paganism. Linguistic evidence indicates that part of Slavic pre-Christianity developed when the Balts and Slavs shared a common language. Pre-Christian Slavic beliefs contained elements also found in Baltic religions. After the Slavic and Baltic languages diverged, the early Slavs interacted with Iranian peoples and incorporated elements of Iranian spirituality. Early Iranian and Slavic supreme gods were considered givers of wealth, unlike the supreme thunder gods of other European religions. Slavs and Iranians had demons, with names from similar linguistic roots Iranian diva and Slavic divyu, and a concept of dualism, good and evil, although evidence of pre-Christian Slavic worship is scarce suggesting that Slavic pre-Christianity was an iconic, religious sites and idols are most plentiful in Ukraine and Poland. Slavic temples and indoor places of worship are rare, outdoor places of worship are more common, especially in Kievan Rus. These outdoor cultic sites were often on hills and included ringed ditches. Indoor shrines existed. Early Russian sources refer to pagan shrines or altars known as kapishcha. These were small, enclosed structures with an altar inside. One was found in Kiev, surrounded by the bones of sacrificed animals. Pagan temples were documented as destroyed during Christianization. Records of pre-Christian Slavic priests, like the pagan temples, appeared later. 
Although no early evidence of Slavic pre-Christian priests has been found, the prevalence of sorcerers and magicians after Christianization suggests that the pre-Christian Slavs had religious leaders. Slavic pagan priests were believed to commune with the gods, predict the future and prepare for religious rituals. The pagan priests, or magicians known as Volkvi by the Rus people, resisted Christianity after Christianization. The primary chronicle describes a campaign against Christianity in 1071, during a famine. The Volkvi were well received nearly 100 years after Christianization, suggesting that pagan priests had an esteemed position in 1071 and in pre Christian times. Although the Slavic funeral pyre was seen as a means of freeing the soul from the body in a rapid, visible, and public manner, archaeological evidence suggests that the South Slavs quickly adopted the burial practices of their post Roman Balkan neighbors. <laughs> Later history Christianization Christianization began in the 9th century, and was not complete until the second half of the 12th. The Christianization of Bulgaria resulted from Boris I's shifting political alliances with the Kingdom of the East Franks and the Byzantine Empire and his reception by the Pope. Because of Bulgaria's strategic position, the Greek East and the Latin West wanted its people to adhere to their liturgies and ally with them politically. After overtures from each side, Boris aligned with Constantinople. Through Byzantium, he secured an autocephalous Bulgarian national church. Although there is some evidence of early Christianization of the East Slavs, Kievan Rus remained largely pagan or relapsed into paganism before the baptism of Vladimir the Great in the 980s. The Christianization of Poland began with the baptism of Mieszko I in 966. Slavic paganism persisted into the 12th century in Pomerania, which began to be Christianized after the creation of the Duchy of Pomerania as part of the Holy Roman Empire in 1121. The process was mostly completed with the Wendish Crusade of 1147. The final stronghold of Slavic paganism were the Rani, with a temple to their god Svetovid on Cape Arcona, which was taken in a campaign by Valdemar I of Denmark in 1168. Topic. Medieval states After Christianization, the Slavs established a number of kingdoms or feudal principalities which persisted through the High Middle Ages. After the 1054 death of Yaroslav the Wise and the breakup of the Kievan Rus, the East Slavs fragmented into a number of principalities from which Muscovy would emerge after 1300 as the most powerful. The western principalities of the former Kievan Rus became parts of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The South Slavs consolidated the Grand Principality of Serbia and the Bulgarian Empire. The Kingdom of Croatia was established between the Kupa, the Una and Adriatic Sea without Istria, and major Dalmatian coastal centers. Benete of Bosnia emerged from 10th century onward through fusion of localities called Zupas, remnants of ecclesiastical division from early Christianity era, while Dukia similarly started shaping up on the south. The West Slavs were distributed among Samos Empire which was the first Slavic state to form in the West, followed by the Great Moravia, and after its decline, the Kingdom of Poland, the Obotritic Confederation modern Eastern Germany the Principality of Nitra modern Slovakia a vassal of the Kingdom of Hungary, and the Duchy of Bohemia modern Czech Rep. <laughs> Slavic studies The debate between proponents of autochthonism and allochthonism began in 1745, when Johann Christoph de Jordan published De Originibus Slavicis. The 19th-century Slovak philologist and poet Pavel Jozef Safarik, whose theory was founded on Jordanes's Getica, has influenced generations of scholars. Jordanes equated the Sklavines, the Antes and the Venethi or Venity, based on earlier sources such as Pliny the Elder, Tacitus and Ptolemy. Safarik's legacy was his vision of a Slavic history and the use of linguistics for its study. Polish scholar Tadeusz Wojciechowski (1839–1919) was the first to use place names in the study of Slavic history, followed by A. L. Pogodin and botanist J. Rostofinski. The first scholar to introduce archaeological data into the discourse about the early Slavs, Luber Niederle (1865–1944), endorsed Rostofinsky's theory in his multi-volume Antiquities of the Slavs. Vikanti V. Kavoika (1850–1914), a Ukrainian archaeologist of Czech origin, linked the Slavs with the Neolithic Kukuteni culture. 
A. A. Spison attributed finds of silver and bronze in central and southern Ukraine to the Antis. Czech archaeologist Ivan Burkovsky postulated the existence of a Slavic prog type of pottery. Boris Rybakov has linked Spison's Antian antiquities with Cherniakov culture remains excavated by Kavoika, theorizing that the former should be attributed to the Slavs. The debate became politically charged during the 19th century, particularly in connection with the partitions of Poland and the German Drang Nach Austin, and the question of whether Germanic or Slavic peoples were indigenous east of the Oder was used to pursue German and Polish claims to the region. Some modern scholars debate the meaning and usage of the term Slav depending on the context in which it is used. The word can refer to a culture or cultures living north of the river Danube, east of the river Elbe, and west of the river Vistula during the 530s CE. Slav is also an identifier for the ethnic group shared by these cultures, and denotes any language with linguistic ties to the modern Slavic language family which may have no connection to a common culture or shared ethnicity. Despite these concepts of Slav, they argue that it is unclear whether any of the descriptions add to an accurate representation of the group's history. Historians such as George Vernadsky, Florin Kurta, and Michael Karpovich have questioned how, why, and to what degree, the Slavs were a cohesive society between the 6th and 9th centuries. The Austrian historian Walter Pohl writes that apparently ethnicity operated on at least two levels, the common Slavic identity, and the identity of single Slavic groups, tribes, or peoples of different sizes that gradually developed, very often taking their name from the territory they lived in. These regional ethnogenesis inspired by Slavic tradition incorporated considerable remnants of Roman and Germanic population ready enough to give up ethnic identities that had lost their cohesion. See also Slavs Lech, Czech, and Rus List of ancient Slavic peoples and tribes References Citations Sources <references> 